I have a question for you. Since you've clicked on this video, I'm going to assume that you happen to like old video games. So, how many Game Boy games do you know? You probably know the one that I'm playing right now, but how about this? It sold over a million copies, and that was at a time when selling a million copies was a rare and special thing. And no one remembers Solar Striker. And if I pop in something like this, you'll probably go, Oh yeah, they did make some Mega Man games for the Game Boy. There's just over 1,000 cartridges for the original Game Boy out there, and an absolutely absurd number of them are unique spin-offs or sequels to other popular games. Did you know that there's a unique Oddworld game for the Game Boy? Of course you didn't. Who knows that stuff? It's things like this Oddworld game that make me consider the Game Boy to be the most popular overlooked console out there. It's not a popular platform for retrospectives. Some of that is that the system just isn't photogenic. That 2-bit monochrome doesn't help there. But I also think it's because the platform has the reputation of not having the real games. The Game Boy might have some Gradius games on it, but they're not the real Gradius games. That attitude is unfair. The spin-offs of these series for portable systems are significant. They're a distillation of the concepts behind the franchise, an attempt to get the heart and soul of those concepts onto a platform where they don't have the color, they don't have the resolution, they don't have the sound, they don't have the power. They don't even have the playtime available to them, between battery life and short play sessions. The choices they made when developing these games for the Game Boy reveal some things about their inspirations. And that's what I want to explore with this series? Well, we'll see how happy I am with how this video turns out. I'm going to be taking a look at some of those Game Boy spin-offs and ports, looking for the unique and creative aspects in them. I want to see how they made these games work on the Game Boy, or in some cases, how they didn't work. Maybe I'll find some special games to get overlooked, or maybe I'll just find a port that's more of a historical curiosity than something people want to go back to. I'm playing these games on a Super Game Boy 2, the improved version of the Super Game Boy with the correct timing and peripheral support that came out in Japan. When it comes to collecting retro games, I enjoy importing the Japanese versions, so the versions you'll see here are from Japan, and if you're more familiar with a US or European version, you might see some variations. The subject for this video are three IREM games. Not the only ports and spin-offs to the Game Boy that IREM did, but a good sampling of what they had. Why IREM? Why not Capcom or Konami or Nintendo? Well, mainly because I think IREM's Game Boy games are more overlooked than others. If I do more videos like this, well, I have a list of literally hundreds of games to talk about. All the games I'm going to be talking about were originally arcade games, but they had popular home versions that are better points of reference. And I'm starting off with Gansou Yanchamaru, or the original Yanchamaru, because they put exclamation points in a weird place. Released in the summer of 1991, this Game Boy title is actually the second game in the Yanchamaru series. The first game was released in the US as Kid Nicky Radical Ninja, and the rest of the series never made it out of Japan. The Yanchamaru games are all about a ninja who has a sword that he spins in front of him, and that's really everything significant about him. Beyond that, they're relatively straightforward platforming action games. The kind of thing that should be perfect for a Game Boy version. Even the quickest glance at the Famicom version tells us that Danzo Yanchamaru is a whole new game. This is a totally unique Yanchamaru game created specifically for the Game Boy. Different levels, different enemies, different bosses, different mechanics. The plot is... um... Actually, I don't know what the plot is here. I don't have a manual for this one, and as I pointed out, Game Boy games are extra poorly documented. You do rescue a princess at the end of the game, so let's just say that a princess has been kidnapped, and it's up to Ninja Yanchamaru to get her back. Realistically, it's probably nothing more than that anyways. One of the first things you'll notice when you start playing is that the scale of the game is much smaller. There are four worlds with three levels each, and a boss at the end of every world. 
So that's 12 stages total here, and they're relatively small stages. It's a scale of game that's definitely intended for a battery-powered handheld. Once you know the game, beating it in under 20 minutes isn't a real problem. Nunjamaru's primary method of attacking is spinning his sword in front of him. And that's a carryover from Kaiketsu Yanchamaru, the original game. Yeah, it's a little bit confusing when they call the second game in the series the original. The big gameplay changeup for Gonzo Yanchamaru was the addition of Super Mario Bros. style blocks that are piled everywhere. Yanchamaru can smash these with his sword and find some useful items in them, like coins. Boy, that sounds familiar. If you collect 100 coins, then you'll get an extra life. That sounds really familiar. Though, unlike that other game, you have to wait until you complete a stage to get extra lives for your coins. You can also get a power-up that allows you to fire a long-ranged attack. Though this isn't a flower that gives you the ability to shoot fireballs. It's a shuriken, and you only get 10 of them. They aren't something that you can turn off and on, so once you pick them up, every time you hit the fire button, you throw one. It winds up making them not especially useful. You can also find stars that make you invincible for a short while. Wait, that's the other game. Here, there's scrolls that make you invincible for a short while. And, of course, extra lives. Yeah, fair enough with that one. There are also doors that will take you to bonus rooms. And here you'll just find a big pile of blocks that will have coins behind them. It's always annoying to get a scroll or shuriken and then find a bonus room immediately afterward. Those items will run out long before you're done in the bonus room. Fortunately, when you come out of the bonus room, all of the blocks and items within them respawn, except for the door to the bonus room. In the actual original Yanchamaru game, the stages were wide open affairs, except for the platforms and holes you had to deal with, and the enemies that you needed to swipe away. The common enemy that you fought in the original game shows up in the original, the Game Boy one. But the bosses and most of the rest of the enemies are new to the black and white version. The worst of these new enemies are the Tanuki that appear to be blocks until you strike them, then revert to bear form and charge at you. Since you have to be right on top of them to strike the block, they can be extremely difficult to avoid unless you memorize their positions. On later stages, these Tanuki are everywhere, to the point where it's almost worth it to just not hit any blocks in the second half of the game. At the end of stages where there isn't a boss, a bee will fly out, and I mean a letter B, not the insect. Collecting it and then walking onto the steps that act as the end of the stage will trigger a bonus level. And here you knock an enemy into the rapidly changing targets at the far side to determine if you get some extra lives or just some coins. The bosses in Gonzo Yanchamaru are relatively straightforward. You just have to hit them in the head a few times. And it does have to be the head. One thing to watch out for in general, but with the bosses in particular, is that the effects of some attacks last quite a while, and touching those will be instant death. Well, touching anything that's hostile to you is instant death in this game. It's just that's a non-obvious instant death. The same thing goes for the spikes in this stage, which look more like a background element than something that you could run into. Conveniently, Gonzo Yanchamaru tends to throw extra lives at you like crazy. That's convenient since there is no way to continue. Once you get a game over, it's back to the start. On the other hand, this is a relatively easy game. If you've got any skill with video games, it's probably only going to take you a couple of hours to get through it. Comparing it to the Famicom port of the first Yanchamaru game, I think Gonzo Yanchamaru actually plays a bit better. The Famicom game has a lot of the same problems that you see from people who are figuring out how to make good platformers. While the Game Boy game has much better controls, and there's more going on with every stage. The only real negative I have for the game are those Tanukis that pop out of blocks constantly. Those things are not fun to deal with. This is the only Game Boy entry in the Yanchamaru series, which isn't that much of a surprise, since shortly after this game, Iron revived it for two more sequels on the Famicom, but that was it. Perhaps the success of the Game Boy version inspired those additional sequels. And I have to say, Gonzo Yanchamaru is a good entry in the Yanchamaru series. That's a series that's always been a little bit, let's say, flaky. 
Never as good as you want it to be, but I've always kind of liked them. I think it works pretty well on the Game Boy. And definitely a good one to play on the go. Now I'm stepping backwards a few months to March 19th, 1991, and the release of R-Type for the Game Boy. This version of R-Type demonstrates the other approach that publishers took when bringing their series to the Game Boy. Ganso Yanchamaru was an original game in the Yanchamaru series specifically built for the Game Boy. R-Type, on the other hand, is an attempt to port the original game to the system. R-Type was a monster success for Irem in the arcades, and it was one of the flagship releases for the PC Engine. That's the version I'm playing here. It's obvious that the Game Boy port has to make more compromises than just the color palette and resolution. R-Type is a big shoot 'em up with a ton of things happening. Scaling that for the Game Boy requires a lot of very careful compromises. And I actually think that the final result turned out pretty well. It's not the version of R-Type you'd want to go back to. But if you were playing your Game Boy in 1991, I think you'd be very happy with this port. If you're not familiar with R-Type, it's in the mold of the shoot 'em up of the late 80s. You've got one ship, an alien fleet that's invading, and you've got to destroy them all. Your spacecraft can fire tiny bullets as fast as you can mash the button, or you can hold B down to charge up a big shot. More importantly, taking out certain enemies releases a power-up. And in the Game Boy version, there's only five of these power-ups. Speed Up, which does exactly what you'd expect, and you'll probably want at least one of those. And there's an option that will fly above your ship and screen you from some attacks. If you power up enough, they can also fire some additional shots. The other three power-ups are numbered 1, 2, and 3. And the first time that you collect any of these, a pod will fly out from the back of the screen. This pod will shoot when you shoot, and you can run into it to attach it to the front or back of your ship. Collecting another of those numbered power-ups will strengthen your attack and give you an appropriate weapon. The number one weapon fires lasers out of the pod at an angle, and these lasers bounce off surfaces for a while. The number two weapon fires a ring laser out of the pod. It's a pretty large attack which makes it useful for clearing a path. Finally, the number three weapon shoots flames up and down when you hit fire, and then these flames track along the ground. All of these weapons can be useful in the correct circumstance, but the really important thing here is your ship's pod. What position it's in determines which way your weapon fires, so if you've mounted it to the rear of your ship, you'll be firing behind you. The pod automatically blocks small shots, so it acts as a shield for your own ship. And if you hit the A button, then the pod launches off rocketing to the far end of the screen, doing damage on the way, and then slowly floating back to you, still firing when you do. If the pod's been upgraded, its shots will also travel at some angle. The exact direction varies for each of those weapons. Understanding how to use your pod is the most important thing in R-Type. Knowing when to launch it to clear a path in front of you, or get it into exactly the right position to do extreme damage to a boss. Not to mention positioning it exactly right so that the pod can protect you. The most significant modification that was performed to bring R-Type to the Game Boy was dramatically reducing the quantity of enemy ships. You'll rarely see more than two or three on screen at once. Everything is also a lot smaller, and I'm not just talking about the size of the Game Boy's screen. The play area is scaled down to fit on that screen, but your ship and the enemies aren't scaled down that same amount, so you're always going to have a lot less room to maneuver in the Game Boy version. The Game Boy port is also a lot slower than other versions, though that's to be expected. These were all significant compromises, but not unexpected ones on the Game Boy. Years later, Irem would revisit this exact port and colorize it for the Game Boy Color as Archetype DX. They made a few other very minor tweaks in the process of the update, but it's basically this port all over again. I think R-Type on the Game Boy is a good example of why the Game Boy struggles for recognition among fans of old games. In 1991, this is a fantastic port, 
It's amazing that they fit so much into a portable system. The bosses are all here and mostly recognizable. The big weapons all work as they should. Most of the stages are here, though they did have to cut out a couple. It even gives you something close to the arcade challenge, only letting you have three credits with which to clear the game. But the medium was important to this version of R-Type. The fact that you could get your gray Game Boy brick and some AA batteries, and then play a pretty good version of R-Type wherever you went, is part of why the port's impressive. These days, when you can play the actual arcade version on the go wherever, it becomes a historical footnote, a strange curiosity, something that only people who are collecting R-Type, or I guess Game Boy, would bother engaging with. Maybe the nicest thing about it from a modern perspective is that it's an easier version of R-Type. Though if you were using save states and rewind, that matters a lot less. This is the tragedy of the Game Boy, and I think if we keep digging into the library like this, we're going to come across this story many more times. I'm back to looking at a platformer with Daik no Gensan Ghost Building Company. Yes, half that title is in English. This did get an international release as Hammer and Harry Ghost Building Company, so you can find an English version of this one if you want that. Like no Gensan, which basically means Gen the Carpenter, started out like the other games I've talked about in this video as an arcade title. But the point of comparison is going to be the Famicom version, which I'd say was the most successful Gensan game. Well, not counting the Pachi Slot franchise. Thing is, though, I don't have the numbers to back it up, but I think Ghost Building Company might actually be the most successful Daik no Gensan game. Or at least there were two more console games, one on the Famicom and one on the Super Famicom, and four more Game Boy games. Not all of those are platformers, either. Ghost Building Company is a platformer, and just looking at it, I actually think the visual design is better in the Game Boy version than it is on the Famicom. Everything has a lot more character. The plot of Ghost Building Company is that ghosts are smashing up the city and abducting your girlfriend. And as a carpenter, it's your job to stop them. Carpenters ain't afraid of no ghost. All of Gin's moves carry over to the handheld. By default, you can just jump and swing your hammer. But when you get power-ups, you can swing your hammer in a full circle, get a giant hammer that does extra damage, or replace your hammer with a giant steel mace that really knocks things around. If you get hit, you lose your power-ups. And enemies are pretty dense in this game, so it's tough to hold on to them for long. Another power-up you can collect is a hard hat that will absorb one hit for you. And naturally, there's items that can restore your health. One of the most important moves Gen has, though it might not seem important at first, is putting the hammer above his head by pressing up. He'll do a little thrust with it if you hit the B button, and this is a vital technique for dealing with any incoming attacks. Bosses in particular tend to fly above your head dropping things on you, and you can use this to knock them back. There are five chapters in Ghost Building Company, though they're a bit longer than you might expect. There's a narrative flow to the stages that will eventually wind up at a boss, and that will take you through several different environments. And some of the stages include shoot 'em up sections. Initially, Gen is flying a plane, and later on he just flies under his own power. Ghost Building Company is a brutally difficult game, as enemies tend to spawn in fast, and not really give you a whole lot of room to work with. The zoomed-in view that results from the Game Boy's low resolution doesn't help here. Fortunately, you have infinite continues, though there is no password system or default way to skip ahead. And even with just five chapters, the game is relatively long for an action title on the Game Boy. Playing it straight through will take you about 30 to 40 minutes if you're good at the game. And the bosses seem to be especially nasty in this one. The second boss, for example, requires that you knock its bombs back at them. When the bombs explode, they cover a pretty big area, and the boss hurls a ton of bombs at you. You're gonna get hit a lot just trying to juggle things. Then you have to dodge the boss and the explosions as it switches sides. Comparing Ghost Building Company with the Famicom Daik no Gensan, I honestly think Ghost Building Company is a better game. 
At the very least, it has better stages and more interesting bosses. And the Famicom game wasn't a bad game. It's just Ghost Building Company is a really good game. All you've really lost in the shift to the Game Boy is color. But otherwise, it's really good. A game that should get more recognition, except it's on the Game Boy. And that's three Irem Game Boy games. Of course, Irem made quite a few more Game Boy games than that, many of which were spin-offs of their games on other platforms. Besides the additional Gensan games, there's a unique Ninja Spirit sequel, a sequel to the incredibly rare and expensive Super Famicom game Undercover Cops, and a version of Spartan X, Irem's massive arcade hit known internationally as Kung Fu. And of course, Irem is far from the only company with this kind of Game Boy catalog. There's hardly a video game publisher who hasn't spun off some of their major games onto a portable platform. Portable gaming is a major part of the history of video games, and it deserves to be looked at more closely. It's where the real hidden gems are lying.